with uh, today's uh, lecture uh, there will be a, a change in the direction we have been taking so far. Uh, so far as you know we have been uh, dealing with uh, history, with philosophy, with health but today we are moving to diseases. So that is a major uh, shift and uh, contents of today's uh, lecture will be as I have shown here the definition of diseases in Ayurveda which we have already referred to earlier but we will be saying something about what I call archaeoepidemiologic study uh, that is the kind of diseases which existed 2000 years ago the prevalence of diseases how things were at that time to the extent we can get that information it will be of uh, some interest that will be a subject I will deal with then we will deal with uh, medical diseases how a particular disease was treated in Ayurveda or is treated in Ayurveda and how it is treated in uh, modern medicine because we hear so much about holistic medicine without any specific examples. Uh, so there is nothing uh, be, uh, better to understand something by uh, than by giving an illustration an example so that we know how a particular disease is treated in Ayurveda when we say to, so much about holistic medicine how exactly is tuberculosis treated in Ayurveda how it is treated in modern medicine that gives you an idea uh, how they differ in what respects they differ and uh, the similarly a surgical disease also how is it de dealt with in Ayurveda how is it dealt with in modern medicine uh, the two different approaches that I will be touching upon and uh, there is a great upsurge of interest in Ayurveda globally I will also briefly refer to that that will be the uh, contents of today's lecture. Now when you look at uh, diseases this definition we have already said uh, it is a state of equilibrium uh, in the body of the body components or what are called dhatus of doshas all these when they are in a state of equilibrium uh, that is what we define as uh, health it is not just absence of disease in other words and it is the derangement or a disequilibrium that is what in Ayurveda constitutes a disease or a disorder and as human body is engineered for good health generally all these disorders they will find order themselves most of the diseases will resolve on their own and the, the job of medicine is really to give a helping hand this also we have touched upon earlier then before considering the uh, Ayurvedic approach to different aspects of diseases such as definition, causation, clinical features etc. It is of some interest to know what kind of diseases existed 2000 years ago because much of what we have said is taken from Charaka Samhita which was written in uh, first century AD. So when Charaka wrote this what was the disease pattern in India he lived in northwest India and this prevalence of diseases that whole subject is referred to as epidemiology. And there is a tendency for most of us to talk about good old days, the golden days of the past. This is a, uh, an impression which many of us have. So was it really a golden age at that time in Charaka's time? So can we get any information about this? Now epidemiology, this subject which deals with this prevalence of diseases, spread of diseases in a community, uh, this whole subject is epidemiology which is a rather new subject because in say 18th century or 17th century if you went to Europe they did not have any epidemiology there at that time. It is really a subject which grew in the uh, 20th century or late 19th century that was the time with the growth of statistics along with this that is how epidemiology grew. Now it has become exceedingly important because only with this kind of information you can do any kind of planning if you know which diseases are more common, how common it is, the numbers involved then only you can plan for disease control 
etc. So every country now including India, we have institutes of epidemiology, there is one right in Chennai and their job is essentially to do this, collect information on the prevalence of diseases, on the spread of diseases, changing pattern of diseases, etc. Because disease control today or hospitals being set up, these are very large sums are involved, government investment, private investment and unless they have this information, they cannot make intelligent investments. So therefore, the kind of information on prevalence, on the rate of spread, fluctuations in virulence, a disease which is highly virulent, AIDS, there is an impression that after 10 years it is not as virulent as it used to be. This happens with practically all diseases. And uh, this particular subject, the, there is a epidemiology when it started long time ago and today, what is one major difference that we are finding? There is what is called epidemiologic transition. Now this transition in all societies, whether it is Europe or Africa or India, uh, we see this pattern. It always starts with a country which is impoverished, poor, low per capita income, public health is poor, malnutrition is very common, that kind of a society. Typically like India, India gained freedom in 1947, that is a landmark and if you take the statistics at that time, our life expectancy was only 40 or less than 40. Today the life expectancy is 65, so there is a very big change. And many African countries the life expectancy is only 35. So there is a big difference in a society where poverty is very common, malnutrition is very common, housing conditions are extremely bad. Now that kind of a, a society, you will always find uh, the health statistics are very poor, life expectancy will be low, infant mortality will be very high, maternal mortality will be very high. So that is the initial stage where a community or a society begins. But then as the progress is being made, socio-economic progress, housing improves, nutrition improves, per capita income improves, life expectancy goes up, then you will find slowly these infectious diseases, poverty related diseases, they slowly disappear and people have more money, they have better nutrition, housing is better. Now that transition, when that takes place, you will find that like India is very much going into that direction. You can see the poverty compared to 1950 or 47 and today poverty alleviation is very significant. Housing is very much better. People live longer. So that is the epidemiologic transition. Every society goes through this. Now this is not because of uh, uh, medical doctors, Ayurvedic doctors treating patients. That is how patients, that is not correct. That is an impression which uh, we should correct. Because the best example is in history, industrial revolution as you all know started in uh, Britain. And when the industrial revolution started, large scale employment of uh, especially in uh, Lancashire, towns of Liverpool and Manchester, large number of people, factories coming, making things in large numbers, manufacture. So thousands of people were finding jobs, all coming to this town and the town had no municipal facilities to house all these people. So they simply collapsed the municipal setup, whatever they had. So with the result, the laborers, their condition was extremely poor and the manufacturers were uh, business people. They could not care less uh, for the, manuf the laborers. They were out to make profit, capitalism in full bl blast. So that con conditions, there are enough literature on this. Epidemics were extremely common, cholera, tuberculosis was very common. Mortality among children was extremely high. In fact, a mother who wanted to work and make money, she would give opium to the child so that the child won't disturb. That's, that was the kind of inhumanity which prevailed at that time. Now at that time there were doctors there and the doctors could not really treat all this. So what happened? How did this change in, in uh, Lancashire at that time? It is a very good example. Now this horrible situation in uh, Liverpool and surroundings at that time. It changed not because of medical doctors, not because of the government doing anything. It changed because of uh, socially oriented people, good people. They got together. They said this, taking all these people to doctors, it is no solution to this. They cannot solve this problem, tuberculosis. There was no treatment. 
cholera there was no treatment all these what is the point we should do something else here and they started these good people of lancashire with no great leader they are simple ordinary people like us clean water clean air well ventilated houses and two good meals a day sounds exceedingly simple and the doctors made fun of them but they persisted and with the result in two years the whole picture changed so therefore this epidemiologic transition what we are talking about medical ayurveda or modern medicine that can take take care of individuals or groups of individuals but when you are talking about a community a million people that medical treatment cannot do anything including ayurveda what really happens is a community good people and the whole housing the code of conduct all these things become important compassion for children etc so epidemiologic transition when we talk about the real engine for that is not really medical treatment that we should remember in other words more money and more science a lot of investment in science that cannot solve this problem investment in science they can make machines they can make drugs but that will not solve this problem so if you want a solution at the community level involving millions of people that needs a different approach that i think we should remember whenever we discuss this subject of epidemiologic transition now prevalence of diseases in ancient india this is a very interesting subject for me at any rate because the we know that diseases existed in the vedas we have gone through that in great detail the charaka sushrada vagbhada we have covered a large number of diseases are mentioned they were there in those days now is it possible to estimate the prevalence of these diseases tuberculosis for example now that is the question we are trying to deal with but then in those days no you will not find statistics like uh, 10 people out of 100 people get this disease they never had that kind of data collection even in europe for example in uh, as i mentioned 18th century or 17th century you will not find any paper so many for so many thousands that kind of approach was not there in data collection so you can't expect that in ancient india so therefore what we are trying to do is a very different approach a disease load in the community is there some way you can estimate and uh, that the approach that we are using is something like this if you take a standard textbook of medicine we have a book called davidson like gray's anatomy this davidson's textbook of general medicine deals with all diseases it is not a book for cardiology or nephrology not that kind of book a general medicine book which was a text when i was a student 60 years ago now that book will deal with all diseases now there you will find in those days several pages dealing with diphtheria with typhoid fever diseases which are extremely common accounting for a large mortality but coronary artery disease there may be only two or three pages there will be no reference to aids hiv because it didn't exist nobody knew about that but today if you look at the same davidson's textbook you will find diphtheria typhoid they're all gone into only one page or two pages but you will find 12 pages on coronary artery disease you will find six or seven pages on aids hiv so when you do this this is any standard book you will find this in other words the greater stress is laid on a problem which is a big load on the community that is how the the priority is given in writing general textbooks because the doctors who are trained using this book they should be trained to deal with that this is the general approach now the same thing must be true for a textbook in ayurveda also especially a general book like charaka if you look at charaka samhita written in 2000 you will find he devotes uh, several pages uh, to a particular disease but you may find only small number of pages for another disease they are not equally treated so if you can uh, have some way but physically it is very difficult you cannot keep on reading page after page 120 chapters how many you cannot do this manually almost impossible to do that 
but fortunately technology has helped us now. If you have a digitized version of this text, then you can count. The computer does the counting for you. Just like if we, I was talking with my colleague a little while ago, there are people who get abnormal heartbeats, what are called dysrhythmias. Now some of them are innocuous, some of them are dangerous. So when a man comes and says, I have got some palpitation. Now in early days, we had a problem because when you take him and do an ECG, ECG is normal. So he is getting it sometime uh, when the doctor is not there, you can't get an ECG done. By the time he comes to the hospital, the, that arrhythmia has gone. This was a problem for us. So you have to admit him and connect him to an ECG and keep him in the hospital until we find this. This is not easy as you know. So now we have technology has come. There is a what is called a Holter monitor, which is really a small ECG connected on his chest and he can go around, he can go to the office and that is silently recording the ECG 24 hours or 48 hours. At the end of it, you get these tapes and the computer does the counting and it tells you 24 hours, he had 3, 4 episodes of these abnormal beats. Now this is a similar approach. So if you have a digitized version of Charaka Samhita, which a friend of mine, Professor Yamashita in Kyoto University, he is a great uh, scholar in Ayurveda. In fact, his PhD thesis is on the Sharira Sthana of uh, Charaka Samhita. So he has digitized uh, this text. So he was good enough to give me a floppy of this. And there, if you have a, choose a certain number of diseases on your own criteria, and it is possible to count. So if you find the number of references that you make to a particular disease, a, a disease is referred to a thousand times, another disease is referred to only 50 times. Now that gives you an idea immediately that this disease was not so important as a point of view of the load on the society. Now that is the approach that we used and I chose nine diseases pre-transition. That is these are all infectious diseases which are very common uh, during the early stage of a society when there is poverty, malnutrition and so on. So these are all infective conditions and uh, infectious diseases like grahani, diarrhea, etc., jwara, fevers, soja, tuberculosis, vishuchiga, cholera, viserpa, cellulitis, another infective condition, kushta, leprosy, vrana, ulcers, Vidrithi, abscesses and Masurika, smallpox. These are the conditions which I chose. I thought they would be very common in pre-transition India. And then non-infectious diseases, I chose apasmara, which is seizures, epilepsy, arsha, piles, gulma, gaseous lumps of the abdomen, hrudroga, heart disease, madatya, alcoholic disorders, panduroga, anemia, Prameha, polyureas, mainly it is diabetes, rectapitta, bleeding disorders, must be, we do not know whether it was gastric ulcer or duodenal ulcer, but anyway it is a, a non-infective disease and unmada insanity. These were the nine non-infectious uh, diseases or conditions which I chose for this study because nine are pre-transition, nine are post-transition. That is the ground on which I chose this. And then here, if you look at this, this uh, uh, the red bars which stand out, these are the number of uh, references to a particular disease. And these smaller bars which you see, which are not very significant, I will try to show that these small bars which you see here, all these are references. These red bars which you see, these are the number of references in the Chikilsa Sthana of Charaka Samhita because Chikilsa Sthana deals with the treatment. So that is, these are the red bars which are very prominent in all these, whereas all the others which you see, the smaller bars, these are the references in Sutra Sthana, Vidana Sthana, etc. There is a reason for this because treatment dominated, that was the main reason these books were written. So how, that is where you are likely to see the largest number of references. Those, you will notice that the treatment references are so much more than the reference to 
causation and so on because the very fact nobody knew the causation. So the discussion is very very small some of them insignificant in that green, green bar is collectively all the references in the uh, charaka for uh, these diseases which I have mentioned here that is the first thing. So the importance of treatment was so much more than all the discussions on causation, clinical science etc. etc. that received much less attention because very little was known that is the first and uh, these are the non-infectious the earlier one was infection. Now I will show the actual numbers now here this is taken from the that bar diagram. Now here if you look at the infectious is on the left hand side and uh, non-infectious uh, is on the on this side and if you look at this like fevers that is the largest number 430 references. Now this fever that includes it is called collectively called jora. many of them are actually typhoid fever when you read that it is very clear but there could be other fevers also viral fevers we cannot distinguish that they were not distinguished in those days it is called vishamajura there are fevers which come on the third day or fourth day there could be malaria. So essentially this fevers they include all those there are 430 references tuberculosis there are 133 sores and ulcers 87 digestive disorders 84 like diarrheas and skin disease and leprosy they are combined Kushta does not always mean leprosy many other skin lesions are included in that that is 64. Now if you look at the non-infectious the largest is gaseous distension flatulence 132 bleeding disorders rectapitta that is 95 piles 77 epilepsy 60 and heart disease is 59. Cellulitis infectious again we continue cellulitis Viserpa is 55, cholera Vishuchika 22, abscesses 11, this next is very interesting smallpox 2 and this smallpox if you look at that the description it does not look like the smallpox that we know it talks about a rash like Masur Dal that is what it says and it comes and disappears and that is very dangerous that is all it says. Now it is difficult for me to believe that smallpox I do not know whether any of you have seen smallpox because we do not see it now fortunately but smallpox if you have seen you can never forget it it is one of the most awful diseases how that comes and that how what initially is an eruption that becomes a pustule and how these scabs form the horribly disfiguring if they survive at all and the mortality was 70 80 percent confluent smallpox for example everybody dies. Now that kind of a disease with an observant physician like Charaka I cannot believe it will be dismissed in two references and those are dubious references they do not look like smallpox. The only conclusion at least for me smallpox did not exist in where Charaka was practicing it came later to India there is no other and there could be some other eruptive fever which could have been fatal that is what he is talking about called Masurika. In fact P. V. Sharma one of the great uh, scholars in Banaras who translated Charaka Samhita he calls it chicken pox that is what he calls it this Masurika but he did not count it or anything but from the description in Charaka Samhita he calls it chicken pox that is how ambivalent one is about this. But here what is important to us is when you look at all these numbers you find only two references to Masurika that immediately puts a doubt in our mind and non-infectious diabetes Prameha that is 51, diseases of pallor Panduroga is 49, insanity is 35, alcoholic disorders 22. So the total if you look at that non-infectious 580 and infectious is 888 this is exactly what we would expect an early part stage of a society pre transitions this is the kind of statistics very much larger number of references to infective conditions and much less for non infective that is what we would expect it, that is what we find here. So the Characa's time we should not have the illusion that it was a golden period it was not 
that is why in the beginning itself he says when a physician sees a patient before you begin the treatment you should ask yourself is it curable, is it curable with difficulty, is it incurable. He himself knew that many diseases they were incurable, he knew that like Vishamat Jura when the description goes on finally he says you have to pray to Lord Shiva because they were so difficult to treat typhoid fever. When I was a medical student typhoid fever mortality was 30 percent, today we do not even admit them. So, the in those days must have been much worse. So, this is a, an exercise in archaeoepidemiology and what do we find from this? That is infectious diseases were much more common that is we have already discuss, discussed it and this is in conformity with the universal experience and several conditions such as fevers include malaria, typhoid etcetera, gastroenteritis and tuberculosis continue high prevalence even today we have not been able to control them and only two questionable references to smallpox that is I think very important. And then we go on with other observations the number of references to treatment of diseases which I said in the beginning they greatly outnumber any reference to causation, clinical features and so on. Now this is even true to some extent today a disease may not be fully understood in terms of its etiology in scientific terms, but there will be we are obliged to treat them. When a patient comes we cannot say the etiology has not been worked out, so we cannot treat you. So therefore with whatever inadequate knowledge we have about a particular disease you may still have to treat. So the information publications etc on treatment will always be more than the work being done on causation and other aspects of uh, a disease. And in ancient times as well as 21st century this is the point which I made now but interesting many dreaded diseases in those days like cholera, typhoid, diabetes, piles, anemia these are no longer a matter of concern we can easily treat them, we can very satisfactorily treat them. And other important observations now rare conditions which we see they existed even at that time. There is a disease called Sankhaka and this Sankhaka is exactly cavernous sinus thrombosis very dangerous condition that is a, a big venous sinus inside the head through which number of important structures including nerves pass that can develop infective thrombosis endangering life. Now that existed at that time. Similarly sinus headache Suryavarta that existed at that time, migraine existed. So many of these these are not very common conditions but very troublesome difficult to treat now they existed in Charaka's time also. And then there is a particular disease called Urustambha which was considered very dangerous by Charaka. It is not paraplegia this both legs become swollen, patients are very walk with great difficulty they have no loss of sensation and uh, these are not amenable to the usual Ayurvedic treatment of Panchakarma and he talks about how dangerous it is in fact very few survived. So there is a whole chapter on that disease but we never see this Urustampa today. In fact the, uh, the Acharya from whom I learned Charaka Samhita I asked him have you seen this? He said no I have not seen it. He was already 82 when I met him but he said his acharya had seen. Now is there any disease where both legs are swollen, patient is able to walk, it is not paralyzed, sensations are there, there is a whitish color to the leg that is all written there and fatal. What is that disease? The only time this is a matter of sheer intellectual interest, there is no other reason and there is one condition in modern medicine this was no longer seen today, but in the 19th century obstructed labor people women pregnant women the uterus is pressing on the pelvic veins and sometimes labor there is complexity and it is not easy to approach a physician or getting a dai to come and look after she could not do much anyway. So that kind of a difficult very poor obstetric care. There the veins get thrombosed 
and in western medicine there was a condition which was we remember it because the name is a very interesting name phlegmasia alba dolens that is the name of that disease that's how we remember it because it's an unusual name phlegmasia is affecting the vein alba is white dolens deals with pain so here you have a painful white leg that was these women because the vein gets thrombosed so the legs become swollen it's very dangerous because the next time a clot will go into their pulmonary artery and they will be dead there was no treatment now in those days they must have had phlegmel c alba dolens in india which they had in europe in the 17th 18th century you nobody sees that now it is a disease existing at that time which has disappeared mercifully now we come to the so that is an exercise in archaeoepidemiology and this approach incidentally can be used for many other things suppose you want to know charaka's first century medical treatment of a particular disease and in the 6th century of vagpada how was the treatment different how often was enema used for a particular treatment how often was purgatives used or various other questions you can use this approach all you need is the keywords you have a digitized version and you can get very interesting information you may find that a particular treatment was used by charaka it is no longer used by Vak, by vakpata in 6 centuries and it is reasonably accurate information so this approach which we have used for epidemiology it can be used for example interest in using a particular medicinal plant how often was it used in first century how often was it used in the 6th century so there are a number of things you can count and estimate by using this approach and then we move on to uh, which i mentioned it is of some interest we always say ayurveda holistic uh, this this is a vague term for me uh, it, i don't really know what it is holistic everywhere i hear holistic uh, i have a vague idea but that's not good enough i would like to know a particular disease how is it treated in uh, modern medicine how is it treated in ayurveda take an ayurvedic text a standard text like vagpada well known used very extensively by ayurvedic physicians based on that what is the optimal treatment of tuberculosis and how is this treated in modern medicine you take a similar text like davidson what is the recommended treatment now if you look at that that is specific we don't have to talk in terms about holistic that way you don't get into any specifics at all like when you in biomedical engineering we have a colleague here now if you say biocompatibility that is a vague term but if you take a specific thing that you are saying that this is blood compatible and this is the reason for it so many months or years it will remain free from clotting now that is something we can understand otherwise biocompatibility is a big term implying too many things so here this is what we are doing if ayurveda holistic treatment tuberculosis obviously it has to be holistic now this is what it is so a specific example i have taken two one is from the atraya the medical tradition which is uh, tuberculosis the other is pagandara anal fistula a common condition treated in ayurveda even now being treated and commonly treated in surgery today how do they ref- uh, differ that is what i am trying to do here the both these traditions are uh, the ayurveda had atraya and dhanvantari traditions from old times Uh, because dhanvantari tradition is even older than uh, uh, charaka tradition atraya tradition because when you look at the classification of ayurveda the very first is shalya that is surgery so it is an ancient tradition we have gone through that earlier because there is reason to believe that sushruta lived even before the buddha so the surgical tradition of ayurveda goes back to that past and uh, surgery is more recent in modern medicine so both these are conditions often treated in both these branches of medicine and two diseases which i have chosen pulmonary tuberculosis and anal fistula they fall in well known traditions of these modern medicine and if you look at tuberculosis this is i have taken from ashtanga hridaya 
there is a grave prognosis was recognized. In fact, it was called Raja Yakshma, it was the king of diseases because they knew it was extremely dangerous. And the causation, one was over exertion, suppression of physical urges, depletion of body semen, blood, soft tissues. So wasting actually precedes and improper food habits. Now this is interesting, depletion of uh, soft tissues, in other words wasting. Ireland, you, I do not know whether you have heard about the potato famine. In the 19th century, maybe 2 million Irish people, they emigrated to the United States and the United States was not all that prosperous in those days. But the reason for this huge exodus, so, so a small island like Ireland, that was potato famine because of a, a disease affecting the, that was their staple food. And because of this disease, the potatoes just vanished. And the Irish people, they were facing starvation. And one of the options for them to survive was to go away to the United States, an unknown country in those days. Now, at that time, one of the things which happened with this famine and severe malnutrition was tuberculosis. So there is something in this, because if there is a situation where there is extensive malnutrition, severe malnutrition, then you can count on it, tuberculosis is going to be there. This is what happened in Ireland. So when Vagpata says that uh, this wasting, there is something in what he says. We did not face any famine, at least we have no data, but if there is such extensive malnutrition of that degree, then that can predispose to tuberculosis. Improper food habits, these are the causes which uh, Vagpata mentions for sosha or tuberculosis. And then the premonitory signs. We remember the staging of the disease, how it starts with chaya, the accumulation of doshas, then they spread, perturbation, there is a staging which we have five stages and there this premonitory stage is there. At that time the disease is becoming recognizable. Now there nasal congestion, profuse salivation, fatigue, digestive fire under stomach and tissues, decline and wasting begins. This is wasting caused by the disease. Aberrant thoughts, tastes, sensations and dreams, pallor, rapid growth of hair. These are all mentioned as the premonitory signs. Incidentally, the dreams he is talking about I do not know how many of you are familiar, in the 19th century, tuberculosis was a fashionable disease. In other words, uh, if uh, a talented poet like Keats, many of these talented people died of tuberculosis, painters, physicians. So it became almost uh, like today, coronary artery disease is a snobbish disease. All the big people, they have had a coronary artery bypass. So it becomes fashionable to say, I also had a coronary artery bypass. Sounds silly, but it is a fact. There is a club, people who get these diseases. But in the 19th century, tuberculosis was a fashionable disease. Because if you are a highly talented poet, you have to have tuberculosis. And they had dreams. When I see this mention of dreams, and they had, their eyes were shining. All these descriptions you can read. In fact, in Malayalam, we had a great poet called Changambra very talented poet, he died young, he died of tuberculosis. I remember the, he was respected, admired because his eyes were shining and the glow of talent, all this. Then I am always reminded, this was what happened in the 19th century in Europe. Every, every, so many great poets had tuberculosis, so many great painters, Chop, Chopin, the great uh, composer, a Polish who lived in France, he died of tuberculosis. So therefore, there is a certain amount of romance associated with tuberculosis. So dreams, when he talks about, Vagpada must have seen some of this in those days. At least I, I have that feeling. In pallor and rapid growth of hair, these are all the things which uh, are premonitory signs. And then full-blown, the clinical signs and symptoms. There are 11 of them. Nasal congestion continues, repeatedly mentioned difficulty in breathing, cough, 
with expectoration but curiously in this cough with expectoration he does not mention hemoptysis which is very surprising vagpara pain in the head and shoulder hoarse voice there is tubercular laryngitis poor appetite loose stools constipation they alternate vomiting pain on the sides that is by repeated coughing fever and joint pains these are the 11 signs and symptoms they need not all be present in any patient but these are extremely important as we go along in the management of this patient and treatment lifestyle avoiding overuse underuse and misuse of sensors like taking a lot of wine wine was encouraged as part of the treatment it was given but suppose he keeps on taking more that can produce the counter result so therefore the use of sensors the appropriate use that is very important second panchakarma detoxifying the body because we have seen from the the prodromal stage itself doshas are perturbed and they are spread all over and you have got to evacuate these it's not enough to do shamana mild treatment so you have to follow the the course of uh, snehana swedana then you have to have panchakarma given to eliminate uh, from upper part of the body by vomiting emesis lower part of the body if there are symptoms bowel symptoms as you have seen then you have to have virechana or enema so appropriate type of uh, panchakarma will have to be administered repeatedly so that is the main stay as far as medical procedures are concerned the nutritious diet vegetarian and as well as non vegetarian now here charaka talks about carnivorous meat i don't know whether i can't remember whether vagpata also mentions it i think he does what ashtanga sangraha does i'm not sure of ashtanga hridaya but there normally you eat the the meat of animals who, who are which are vegetarians like deer etc you do not eat the meat of carnivorous animals like tigers and lion there is an aversion to using that for some reason but in this situation a wasted tuberculous patient uh, this is given as treatment a carnivorous animals meat and if they know they will not take it so it is considered a all right if you can even mislead them tell them a white lie this is a deer's meat and if he doesn't recognize you can smuggle it in and carnivorous meat because that was considered important to build up his system his resistance his tissues because samanya we we discussed at vishesha you have to build up his uh, uh, muscular uh, system muscles in the body then you have to give, give something similar then only you can build it up that is samanya so here nothing can be more similar than an animal's meat and they considered carnivorous meat was even better so meat non vegetarian diet was very much encouraged and the use of wines and plant based drugs there are a large number of medicinal formulations uh, grida especially prepared in uh, uh, ghee very large number of them are described for the treatment of these now whether any of these that is an area whether any particular uh, molecule from these plants which have anti tuberculous property that sort of research we have done for so long and we have found nothing in fact that search has been futile we have not succeeded something we are either there are no such molecules in these drugs or we have failed to find them one or the other like artemisin in the chinese found for treating falciparum malaria from their 2000 herbal preparations they succeeded dramatically in a matter of 10 years highly focused search now here i would have thought all the research that we are doing on herbal drugs uh, this is something i have not understood our strategy we seem to have gone wrong uh, because tuberculosis is still a very big problem in india we have not eliminated them and if you want to treat them like streptomycin was found that made a huge difference to the management i was in the medical college when it was discovered prior to that western medicine also we had no treatment only sanitary are being built they are isolated that was a very different world but once the pas 
streptomycin, isoniazid. Once this combination came, the whole management of tuberculosis changed. You didn't have to build a sanatorium. Can you imagine two million people in sanatorium? It's physically impossible. No country can afford it. So that domiciliary treatment of tuberculosis became possible only because of antibiotic treatment. Now, if we had in these, let us say, the number of plants used in Ashtanga if there are 50 plants being used for making all these formulations. Obviously, with that, we are not able to control tuberculosis. Even Ayurvedic physicians agree. But then, what have we done? These 50 plants, can you isolate the molecules and can you treat it for controlling that bacterial culture of mycobacterium tuberculosis? Is there some such research that one could do? You know, so many years, 50, 60 years, we have not been able to do that. All sorts of searches go on. Every Ayurvedic journal you take, there will be something about medicinal plants. But here is a problem. If you take these, whatever number of plants are mentioned, and you take the molecules from that, today we have the technology for it, big machines are there, rapid throughput screening, etc., etc. You can screen 10,000 compounds in 5 minutes, that sort of thing they do. So, is there some way the people working in this area? So, we have really not been able to. We still have to use the same Krita, which was prepared by Vagpata. We are still using that. But the molecular level search, we have failed. We have not been able to do anything. And I, I feel uh, it is a failure on our part. We have not done our duty to Vagpata. Because at that time, that was all that was feasible. It is a very big step forward to identify these 50 or 60 plants out of millions of plants. That's a huge step forward. They have made a short list, which could have been done only by great experience and great effort. But we have to go further, and that we have not been able to do. So therefore, the approach here is the plant-based drugs, mostly in the form of uh, ghee-based preparations. But then, this treatment becomes much more complex in Ayurveda, because all these like hoarseness and voice disorders, which are very common in uh, tuberculosis, severe loss of appetite, excessive salivation, vomiting, all these, these are gastrointestinal manifestations of tuberculosis. Sometimes there may be severe laryngitis or it may be intestinal tuberculosis. So all these could happen, secondary effects of pulmonary tuberculosis. So each one of these, there is a separate protocol for treatment. They are almost treated like separate diseases. So, it is just as uh, specialized treatment as pulmonary tuberculosis itself. So, when you put all this together, patients coming to you, they will, uh, uh, somebody with pulmonary tuberculosis, he may also have tubercular laryngitis. So, the treatment of these, when you combine, it becomes really very, very complex. So, that is the uh, uh, summary of uh, the way it was managed in that time. Now, if you look at the, contrast it with the modern medical approach, I have taken 1960 onwards to make sense, because prior to antibiotics, prior to streptomycin pass, isonex, tuberculosis treatment in modern medicine was not very different from Ayurveda. So, when I joined the medical college in 1951, what was the management of tuberculosis like? First of all, it was dreaded, the tuberculosis. And then a patient had to go to a sanatorium, if those who could afford. There were very few sanitaria. In the whole of uh, Travancore state where I was born, there was one place in Nagargoy. That was the only sanatorium in the whole state of Travancore. And only those who could afford would go there. And what was the treatment? Good food. That was one, regular food. A lot of milk is given to drink, etc eggs would be given. Meat was not given that much. Some may be given. But treatment wise there was nothing. Some calcium would be given. Things like that. There was no, if there is cough, there will be some cough medicine. There was no way of treating tuberculosis. This was the condition in western countries and to some extent Velour started late 1950s, tubercular cavity in the lung you could remove that cavity. Surgical treatment of tuberculosis, thoracic surgery. 
and if there was already a cavity ruptured, there is pus in the thoracic cavity that could be treated, that could be drained. That was all the thoracic surgery in those days. Thoracoplasty, you remove all the ribs so that if the lung does not move, lung is immobilized. That is done by removing all the ribs, then the chest wall would collapse. That is called thoracoplasty. This kind of operation, only very few institutions could do that and Vellur was one. There was an American surgeon called Reeve Betts who really started thoracic surgery in India and that was the kind of treatment they had. If somebody had a cavitary tuberculosis and it developed an empyema, pus in the chest in Travancore, his only choice was to go to Vellur to get this done. And mortality was very high as you can well imagine. This was the condition prior to antibiotics. So therefore, the kind of treatment it does not make any sense to talk about it from 1960 onwards and Davidson's book I have used and there you find the mycobacterium tuberculosis was discovered in 1882 by Koch and prior to that it was even more horrible because all these diseases they were considered as separate diseases whether it is tubercular laryngitis, tubercular arthritis, tubercular intestinal ileocecal tuberculosis, all these were, nobody knew the causation. They were all different diseases. You can well imagine the kind of uh, management which must have taken place in say early 18th century. How, it is not good old days, they were bad old days. No knowledge, no treatment, simply groping in the dark and giving a whole lot of medicines which we knew were thoroughly ineffective. This is why Voltaire, he made that famous statement. He said medicine, uh, the doctors give drugs about which they know very little, put it into the body about which they know even less. That was very true because that is what happened in those days. He simply had no idea. It was Koch who discovered the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Then we found that this is what is producing all this, whether it is in the joint or the lung or the larynx, it is one cause. That was a huge change in the approach to the treatment of tuberculosis. And the primary infection in the chest, in the lung, that may be very small, it may be controlled, may even be ignored. But some of them, it will be followed by progression, which we talked about in the discussion on srotas. The first attack of tuberculosis, the gons focus, a small lesion, that will, may not produce any symptoms at all. But that is where it starts and then by the time it develops into pulmonary tuberculosis, a lot of time has passed, weeks or months. During that time, what is happening in the body? Where is it happening? How is it happening? These are the disease process, exceedingly important. Now here you see the primary infection is followed years later by the development of a full-blown disease. And the human and bovine organisms, that bovine organism tuberculosis also can occur through milk. That was abolished by pasteurization forever. We do not see that now. Otherwise, in uh, prior to pasteurization, especially in Europe, it was very common to have glandular tuberculosis in children because of this bovine tuberculosis. We do not see that now. And predisposing causes, overcrowded housing, which I mentioned Lancashire as an example during industrialization several people crowding and living in one, one room, malnutrition, protein, vitamins especially, occupations like mining. Mining, if you go to a place where mining is going on, Rajasthan and UP, you will find where there is a lot of silicosis. Invariably, if they get silica dust, people working in the mines, you will find almost 60, 70 percent of them get tuberculosis. They themselves recognize it because they consider this is a, because they have no choice. That is the only way to make a living. There are a number of social studies. You will still find that people are ready to come to work there because they have no choice. Otherwise, it is starvation. So, they know that my father got tuberculosis. I will also get it. They accept it because there is no choice. And the industrial conditions are so bad. We have an industry act where how to, the condition should be given, but those conditions are seldom observed. Because if you want to observe all those conditions, then the profit margin comes down. So therefore, the conditions in the mines are so bad, industrial conditions. 
so the pulmonary tuberculosis incidence is extremely high and diabetes that is a well known predisposing cause and clinical features systemic toxemia fever lack of appetite sleep sweats malaise flatulent dyspepsia shortness of breath wasting you will find the clinical symptoms are very comparable local effects that is where the this is only possible to detect after cox discovery we know that lungs and bronchi larynx these are all being produced by the same organism which was not known before cox intestine kidneys and bladder meninges lymph nodes bones and joints i have given the common uh, manifestations of tuberculosis which we see in hospitals and treatment prophylactic is improve housing nutrition bcg vaccination in children and this improve housing and nutrition is important because in the uh, industrializing lancashire and europe during the first wave of industrialization when it came i mentioned the kind of conditions which prevailed there and tuberculosis was extremely common where those good samaritans came forward to have a control program they were not medical people tuberculosis organism had not been uh, discovered but they changed they reduced the incidence of tuberculosis by attending to this housing and nutrition they knew nothing about uh, organism or infection or anything but they knew that conditions were very bad and what the doctors writing prescription was useless ineffective and all they tried to do was clean air clean housing nutrition these were the easy to do achievable and they succeeded and this is the reason they succeeded and bcg vaccination in children not effective in adults and full treatment of patients with tuberculosis so that they don't become a source for so many other people and pasteurization of milk for bovine tuberculosis these are the prophylactic measures recommended and curative therapy is uh, chemotherapy which dramatically changed the picture but this curative therapy we must remember it is only effective in individuals or groups of individuals when you deal with millions of people you have to have a different approach this is what i said in the beginning because when we make a claim that because of antibiotics and medical treatment tuberculosis has all disappeared which is simply untrue because we have enough st statistics to show that in new york state like so many other states in europe also from 1880 1890 that is end of 19th century and if you take 1920 early part of the 20th century already the incidence keeps on coming down sharp decline in fact there is a, a very interesting book called medical nemesis written by a man called ivan illich a very highly provocative writer sociologist that book came some 20 30 years ago i created a, a certain amount of uh, international upheaval because it's very well documented now if you read that there he explores this medical myth doctors taking credit for controlling tuberculosis drug industry taking credit for controlling tuberculosis he explores that myth there all these figures you can see that how the tuberculosis incidence coming down year after year towards end of the 19th century the trend begins and by 1920 is very sharp so even if there was no antibiotic at that time at all and what was happening was this the first point improve housing nutrition so if that with that it could have come down on its own so in when you look at the community epidemiologic terms that control comes from social measures socio economic but when it comes to individuals a man with cavitary tuberculosis you cannot send him to a sociologist so it which is a an individual or a group of individuals a few hundreds of patients coming to hospitals those are all individuals that's not we are not talking about say 50 million people in a state that's a very different so the treatment at the individual level at the community level they are based on different principles altogether so this is a point which uh, we should uh, remember because i have heard medical students also believe they sincerely believe 
once antibiotic came tuberculosis is controlled which is not true and chemotherapy streptomycin pass and isoniazid there are others now but these are the uh, the mainstay rest nutritious diet and local treatment must be separate that suppose somebody has bone tuberculosis or joint arthritis tuberculosis arthritis that has to be treated by specialist suppose there is a laryngeal problem which is very severe some ENT person will have to treat so they have to go to a specialist to do this if it is a ileocecal tuberculosis a surgeon has to come in so that depends on the speciality so that is how the tuberculosis is managed today and that now we go on to the surgical condition again to take an example fistula in you know it is a very common condition today it was common in the past also and a lot of importance is given in ayurveda also to treatment of pagandara incidentally historically we talked about jivaka several times bimbisara who was the king in pataliputra he was the father of ajata shatru you may remember a painting i showed here ajata shatru was the son of bimbisara and bimbisara was a great king a contemporary of buddha a disciple of buddha and bimbisara had fistula in eno in fact the jataka tales they say that when the king had fistula in eno he was so embarrassed he would go around sometimes his clothes would be stained and people would make fun and say his majesty is having periods all these are described he used to feel greatly embarrassed and it was jivaka who operated on him and cured him so you can this is a long buddha's time from then onwards surgical management of fistula was known now here the causation in the old tradition there is abscess in the perineum in rectal region progressing to rupture precedes the anal fistula these are all described different varieties are classified interpreted in terms of three doshas and treatment consisted of lubricant therapy like standard fermentation those two are in all these it's given and that is followed by chara sutra is one of the which is still being used by ayurvedic physicians and surgery was also recommended they use a proctoscope i'll show you the pictures in surgical instruments of sushruta they could visualize the internal opening if there is any and the track they could follow using probes all these instruments sushruta had designed and once the this is visualized then the tracks would be laid open sometimes excised and this could be done in stages multiple operations these are all described in sushruta samhita and incidentally the chara sutra it is not mentioned in the surgical treatment of fistula if you read that is chara sutra is not mentioned it is it is mentioned somewhere else so that was not the mainstay of treatment mainstay of treatment was surgical what i have said here like proctoscope visualization and tracing the track using a probe ashani there is a particular instrument which is used to probe it the course of this and then either excision if possible or it would be laying open the track that is the main surgical treatment but in another place it talk, talks about the shara sutra is also there another a lesser alternative and post operative treatment also is described local fermentation application of medicated ointments and so on this is the basis of uh, the basic approach to surgical treatment in dhanvantari uh, tradition of india now these are the instrument they are actually very similar in that uh, with proctoscope being used for uh, on the left hand side the arshoyantra now that has got a little larger openings because you have to do manipulations there you have to if the large piles you have to pull it down you have to apply the chara then you have to turn it and wait for so many matras then you have to turn it around to see to what extent it has worked if it has not fully worked you have to apply it again so you need a little more space uh, to do these maneuvers otherwise they are basically similar instruments and uh, this was one of the uh, the blunt instruments there are 100 blunt instruments of uh, sushruta we will be talking about it later on but these are the instruments some of those instruments he used and in modern medicine the treatment is surgical there is proctoscopy like in ayurveda 
fistulectomy is done, laying open fistulous tracts, elaborate post-operative care, almost identical. While the exact techniques differ, instruments that you use or the proctoscope that we use, all these will be different, but essentially they are same. Surgical treatment of diseases in Thanwantari tradition and modern medicine, they have much in common. And common features are conspicuous, for example, in the use of sedation. Nowadays, we can use anesthesia, but in Sushruta's time, there was no anesthesia. They had only sedation, giving wine and physical control. In fact, in the all surgical descriptions, they will say there has to be strong attendance to hold him. Otherwise, you cannot do the operation. So wine alone will not do. That will sort of dull the pain sensation. Doesn't take it away. So you have to have strong attendance to hold him. Now anesthesia is used. That is one difference. Proctoscopes today they are much better, much less traumatic. So, but again, it is an instrument to visualize him. The purpose is the same. And uh, the procedures, exact details will differ, but in terms of a fistulectomy, laying open the tracks, essentially we are doing the same thing today. And dressings, fermentation, again similar to post-operative care, which was practiced 2000 years ago. So you will find a, a great deal of uh, commonality in the surgical approach, which unfortunately in uh, Ayurveda it came to a full stop, because by 4th century, almost, certainly by the time of uh, Vagpata, surgery had already disappeared from the mainstream of uh, Ayurveda, because these were not done by Ayurvedic physicians. If at all a surgery had to be done, it will be sent to somebody else who belonged to a lower caste. He was branded a lower caste. I will be talking about it, it is a very important subject, uh, how and why this happened, nobody really knows, like bone setters. This is a big chapter in uh, Susurata Samhita, one of the finest uh, chapters. But Ayurvedic Vaidyas, they will not touch. They are all sent to bone setters. That is a different class. So you have a peculiar situation, plastic surgery of the nose, for which India is given credit all over the world, Indian technique. If no Ayurvedic physician would do it. It was always done by the lower caste people in Maharashtra, where the British people actually saw and recorded. It is always done by Kumar caste. This is the people who make pots. They are not doing this. The illiterate people. Father teaches the son. In Coimbatore district, there is a couching of cataract, which Sushruta has described. Now, this couching of cataract, in somewhere in the end of the 19th century, in near Coimbatore, there is an observer has seen this being done. There is an accurate description. And when you read that couching of cataract, really there was no cataract operation or anything. I mean, the way kind of we do it now. But what was done at that time was to take a, a needle and after all the lens is opaque. And they knew if that opaque lens is out of the way, the man could see. This was known. That is how Sushruta describes couching. All it means is with this needle, with a skillful manipulation, you could displace the opaque lens. It is moved away from the field of vision, from the pupil. Now, this is the couching of cataract, which was done in near Coimbatore. I forget the name of the exact place. It is a small village. And there it is written, it is always done by Mohammedans. And another, a caste, which I am not familiar with. And it is described, this is the eyewitness. He says, a uh, man came and his needle was taken. It is put, this is done in a matter of minutes. Very skillful, because he is doing it all the time. But it is only done by these people. No Ayurvedic physician will do it. So therefore, somewhere along that early part of the century, we had this uh, great damage was done to India. And P.C. Ray's, I will be talking about it later. P.C. Ray, perhaps the founder of modern chemistry in India, who wrote the history of Indian chemistry, very great. He is considered an Acharya. And P.C. Ray's book, he mentions all this. And this question of uh, people being denied education, they are been denied any kind of social advancement. He has no way of going up. He will always remain doing this. No education. And he can only do this. So from father to son, they have acquired a lot of skill. 
but unfortunately the couching with the conditions under which it was being done infection rate was very high so immediate result he can see immediately it's a dramatic everybody knows oh he has seen he can see it's a dramatic thing a man who was blind suddenly he can see but unfortunately the infection rate was very high so that when you read that pc race description uh, you can see how much damage we have done to ourselves and he writes there the soil of india for example the sushrutas time dissection was discouraged surgical dissection of cadavers they had to do all kinds of taking off layer by layer very crude type of surgery which destroyed our anatomy we could not progress that is because of the taboos manu would never have you should not touch the body so we introduced all these customs rules and denied ourselves any kind of progress and denied a chance for all these talented people like making steel indians making steel in jabalpur the same thing making a furnace making a refinery extremely fine work but if you ask them why are you doing it like this that i don't know my father taught me so this all through the entire gamut of socio economic life we made this huge mistake so that is a little digression but i think it is important that we realize that thank you